Welcome to Schoenberg's Perennials. The next two episodes are going to be about minimalism. We're going to go through uh, what is mim- minimalism generally, and then sort of talking about uh, Steve Reich and John Adams specifically to sort of round things off. Um, and we're going to hand it over to Holly to inform us about the general aspects of minimalism. Woo! Um, so one of the reasons I wanted to write this episode is because I think whether you know it or not, you probably already know what minimalism is, or you've at least heard a lot of it. Um, for instance... I have. Yes, you definitely have, but I think actually everybody has. For instance, listen to this clip and see what you th- it reminds you of. So this could be this could be an ad for a car. This could be an ad for a cell phone provider. Um, I just hear like inspiration, you know. Yeah, like, or like yeah, inspiration. You can this do is, it. It's like that ad that's out right now that drives me crazy. Where it's like this is where Grandpa will make fr- uh, friends with the d- daughter's boyfriend forever. You know that ad? I hate that ad. I haven't heard this one. Oh, I get it all the time. It's something about owning a wow. house or something, and I'm like, what are you even? Who do you think you are? Anyways, anyway. That's amazing. Basically, I'm excited. Wh- that that is minimalism sort of that's that's what that's what we hear of it um let's compare that with a real well that's like bastardized minimalism yeah it's bastardized that's just me playing chords on my piano to exemplify what this is but let's listen to a real ad that i think is very similar this bmw right whatever it is yeah so what's happening right now isn't true minimalism but what we're hearing is basically really repetitive chords and they're set up in a way that is designed to trigger something emotionally but not to go too far we're not going too far because it's just an ad so we don't want to like have a beginning middle and end we just want to have sort of a general feeling right um Here's yep. another example of that. Another car ad. It's only a car. A car is a car is a car. With nuts and bolts and leather and cogs and steel and wood and glass. Intelligent wipers and head up displays. So the reason I chose this example is actually because he mentions glass, and that to me (laughs) sounds like Philip Glass, who is another minimalist composer that we're not going to be playing anything of today, but he is a very important figure in this genre. Most people have heard Philip Glass in, um, like if you've ever watched the movie Secret Window, he's the composer for that. It's very minimalist, it's very um, mysterious, and it's very repetitive. (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah i would agree yeah. with that it's uh this is a very it's a car ad what am i trying to say it's a car ad yeah um it's a car ad yeah when you first started it i uh was like is this minimalism and then like wait a minute i know why i don't recognize this as minimalism because it's philip exactly glass. And exactly and he philip is glass. kind of his own thing um so philip glass is one of the guys who started this stuff and um he was very influential on a lot of other composers he's not my favorite composer so I'm just not going to nerd out about him as much, but he is an important figure in this. He's very influential on people like Hans Zimmer, and this is an example of something that I think he is influential on. This is a, a little excerpt from The Illusionist. Right, so we have the d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d
repetitive, repetitive, repetitive thing. And then over top of that repetitive figure that keeps going and going and going, we get a little melody over that. And it's important to note, it's very tonal. There's nothing going on here that's, that is dissonant, really. It's, it's very much can really sit at the back of your brain without bothering you. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's like there's nothing for me there's nothing interesting in that at all not in that one and through the course of this episode i'm hoping that we can show how minimalism can be interesting but at the same time it's not everybody's cup of tea and if you get to the end of this episode and you're still like eh, boring then fair enough fair enough um so what is minimalism <laughs> minimalism um it's all those things we just listened to plus one other very important element. So there's repetitive little figures like that to create the ability to build rhythmically. But I think what makes minimalism minimalism in a proper sense is that it does change very gradually over time. So if we take that piece of music as an example, we've got in true minimalism, there would be a slight change at some point that you might not actually notice consciously, sort of like you know, like just like one little note changes here and there, so that it gradually shifts so that by the time you get to the end of the piece, it's a whole different thing but you may not have noticed when it changed or how or why am i right yeah i would agree with that uh steve reich is is my favorite person for that idea where it's i called it uh uh i think of it as like an organic uh, algorithm or, or like a sort of uh a fractal of of notes or something yeah it's cool. Yeah, it, it's sort of like, it's kind of like the plant that I have in my living room right now, which is, is a part of our um, poster for our show. Since I took the picture for our show poster, it has doubled in size, but I didn't notice because it's it's kind of just creepy crawling across my theremin. And, and all of a sudden one day I was like, oh my God, you're twice as big, but I never noticed it growing. It's kind of like that. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I really love minimalism myself. I love how it has lots of layers of different textures um, and rhythm. It can feel very complex, but it's also relatively tonal, um, especially if you're listening to somebody like John Adams, who I'm going to cover uh, at some point. Um, I, f I personally find it really meditative. It really relaxes my mind. Um, it's also really cool when you listen to a piece of minimalism that involves the voice because usually the orchestra will have that repetitive stuff and then the melody of the voice can just soar right on top of that um so for me it's it's yeah. one of two genres of music that actually relaxes my brain there's um math metal and there's minimalism and that's what i go to at the end of a long day of teaching children <laughs> whatever works yeah, yeah got to i want to do one more example here of of something that i actually think is minimalist um, even though actually uh, it's it's coming from a French pop band. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with Phoenix, I think. Um, this is Daft Punk, by the way, who inserted this little middle bit.
you can hear how it was going. One two three, one two three, one two three, one two three, and then it went one two three four, one two three four, one two three four, one two three four for a bit, and then they added in little extra textures, and by the end of it, it was a different thing than where it started. That's a really quick version of minimalism, but I I think it's worth exploring the fact that it it shows up not just in commercials, not just in movies, not just in operas, but also I think that's a little teeny tiny tidbit of it in a pop song. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that just sounds like. Uh the Philip Glass soundtrack that he did the oh like watch a watch a watch I can't remember it has a you you go Slavia or something I can't remember the title it's like a ridiculously long one okay I'm um, not familiar with it I it's it it, it kind of sounds like he, they took the the sound of that and made it more interesting because he Philip Glass does like panels where he'll have one repeated loop and then he'll just switch to the next loop Mm -hmm. quick like throughout whereas this one slowly evolved yes yes and i think the evolution is what makes it more interesting so i guess let's just use my favorite quote ever from one of the professors that we both had giorgio who said philip glass moves but he doesn't go anywhere (laughs) i love that (laughs) whereas i'm gonna argue that some minimalist composers do make their music go somewhere. Um, we're going to be talking about two people who do that. Um, today, we're going to be talking about Steve Reich. So I'm going to hand it back over to you. So with that brief introduction to minimalism, let's talk about Steve Reich. So I'm gonna talk, Yeah, he's a great guy. Anyway, I, I just want to mention a bit of his background. So he was taught by Berio, which is interesting. Whoa, um, that's wild. Yes, it's very odd. And he completely rejected 12-tone music and sort of all, you know, dissonant stuff. Um, yeah, like for those of you who don't know, Barrio does really weird stuff and I love it. It's the kind of stuff where I'm, where I'm like, I got to learn this. I got to do it. So you, that that's how weird it is. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's hard. It's hardcore. It's like... He it, does like hard. extended technique kind of stuff. Like he, the one thing that I know from him is the the one he wrote for the, the Soprano, I think, that's got all the extended techniques like... Mm. And you yeah. know, like, like it's 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 wackadoo, and it's a graphic score, and I love it. It's so cool. <laughs> yeah, so he does he does very odd stuff, and Steve Reich was not having it. He said, "Nope, I don't want to. I don't want to do that. I want to make tonal things." So he mm-hmm. made tonal things. Um, he says he loves tonality and um, wants to make tonal music. So he did yep. that. And it's um, just like John Adams too. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think they're all in the same boat. They were all taught by similar people and they were like, "No, we don't we don't want to do that. We're going to make our own thing." Yeah. Um, which is, so it's interesting in this podcast because so far we've been talking about people who have been influenced by Schoenberg and wanted to to copy him in some ways. Now we're talking about composers who reacted against what Schoenberg was doing and were like, "Not nah, I'm not into that." Yeah. He's right. He's definitely one of those people. Um yeah, I just wanted to point out the uh, the quote that you said about Georgia is, is applies to Reich as well, where it's like <laughs> Reich is really repetitive, but he does actually go somewhere. Yeah, Reich is almost more repetitive repetitive than Steve uh, than Philip Glass. Um, it's just it's that it's that evolving thing, and I'll, I'll go into a little bit more in detail lo- later about how that actually works. But for the first thing, I'm just gonna play a little clip of piano phase and to. Think about the word phasing, what it means um, when things are phasing in and out of each other. Um, Because this entire talk about Steve Reich is going to be about his phasing ideas in his music. And for me, the phasing is what makes it so interesting. And it's sort of, that's what I listen to when I listen to Steve Reich is the phasing part of the songs. There's like two, there's like two or like 18 different parts phasing in and out of each other. And that's what you're listening for. Cool. In this piece, it's two pianos, and um, they're playing almost the same material, except one of them is like two or three BPM faster. So they usually, I think they have um, click tracks that they're listening to separately, and that's the only, that's the way that they're able to stay uh, in time properly, if that makes sense. <laughs> that's wild. OK, 
Okay, so there you just heard it fa- It was phasing. So they were playing the same thing, and then one of them would be slightly ahead, and it would get sort of muddy for a second, and then it would go back. Did mm. you hear that? I couldn't, but it's pretty, I don't it's have pretty... the greatest headphones in right now. Here, let me fast forward a little bit, and it'll, it'll be more... He, he What he does is he, he, he starts it off really, really subtly, and then he'll sort of ramp it up as it goes. Okay. So I'm just going to go from the middle somewhere. Okay, so did you hear it there? Where? Yeah, yeah. It's the, cool because it's almost like a deconstructed round or cannon. Yeah, in a way. In a way, it's it is it is definitely related to rounds, and I think a lot of his this a lot of these ideas are coming out of of rounds for sure. Yeah, rounds is a good way to think about it. Um, I think though, this one is like a really slow, slow round, and the distance between the round is so small that it's the the dissonance or the the sort of hearing two things at the same time they sort of morph into one and almost become like an audio effect rather than like a a piece if that makes sense yeah absolutely so he's written a lot of these uh phase pieces um there's piano phase there's violin phase he has a song. He has a he has a piece called "Different Trains," and uh, he did a bunch of an electroacoustic music around this phase idea as well. Uh, yeah. I'll play a little bit of the "Come Out" track. I had to like open the bruise up and let the forward. bruise blood come out to show them. So I'm not entirely sure if this is working for you because it has to be in stereo, but basically he has two tape machines that are set differently. And then mm-hmm. the left channel will have tape machine one, the right channel will have tape machine two. And there's sort of like a ping pong delay, except that one side is slightly faster so that it will sort of, again, phase in and out of them singing at the same, saying the same thing at the same time. And then one is slightly forward, then slightly forward more and more and more until you get all the way around in a circle. Yeah. I mean, so far the tracks you've played are slightly maddening. <laughs> what makes them mad? At me? Oh God! It's just it just makes you want to scream. Stop! Yeah, these ones I I showed them first, uh, mostly because they just illustrate the phase idea. I'm not a huge yeah. fan of either of these pieces. I I've okay. never actually listened to piano phase in its entirety, mostly because it's so repetitive. It is yeah. It's it's one piano phrase repeated for 20 minutes. Like there's nothing else to it. Um, mm-hmm. It's, I think it's a fun experiment. I'm not sure I would consider it like an interesting piece. I think it's just a good way to sort of outline um, very clear, because it's very clear. It's like, you know, two things layered on top of them. That's it. There's nothing else to it. Yeah. Um, but let's move on to something maybe a little bit more palatable to people who haven't heard Reich before. And we'll listen to music for 18 musicians. that's just the beginning that's sort of the sound world that this piece lives in okay now we're now we have arrived at the kind of minimalism that i like because that really reminds me of like common tones and simple time by john adams and yep. like i think what makes it not want me it not want me it what makes it not make me yell stop is the fact that he's adding 
different textures like every few bars another thing comes in that like is like part of the picture and it all plays together yes this one has a lot more of what you could call like traditional uh compositional elements it has you know different things coming in and out things seem more ordered it's not just you press play on two tape machines and then see what happens it's like a you've thought about the way that it's put together in a way yeah Um, and it feels like it's like a canvas and then you add a layer and then you add like they're just adding 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 until you get the full picture and then the, the picture is something you couldn't have imagined before yeah for sure this is the first piece of rice that i actually fully absorbed and um i saw it live actually three years ago um, which was really cool um but i think before i heard this one i didn't really like minimalism or i didn't really see the value in it um but this one sort of put me on the path of liking it um yeah and it's it's very interesting it's um i think what's important to note is that the phasing issue the phasing that we talked about in the in the piano phase is still happening here it's just much slower and it's more like the round thing that you were talking about so instead of it being like the amount of time that they're displaced is a millisecond it's now a bar a beat or a bar or like an eighth note Mm-hmm. yeah that so makes that, it easier for your brain to grasp i think it uh, I think it's just that it's easier to play so he can do more complicated things. Like a piano phase is really hard to play. Like you have to be really yeah. concentrated the entire time. So he's not allowed to do a lot of fancy things over top of that. Uh, but later on, we're going to talk about a piece where he was able to overcome that ne- that um, problem and, and fix that. But in this one, because it's, it's still really difficult to actually play because if you lose your place, it's really hard to get back on where you are. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm sure it is. <laughs> like, I got really inspired when I heard this piece, and I wrote a, I wrote a piece that was like what what I consider to be like a really basic idea of of this phasing thing, where I had seven players, and each one was assigned a different duration. So the first one was like two eighth notes, and then the second one was three eighth notes. And what would you you would do is you just play, you'd only play on the first eighth note, and then you'd rest for an eighth note. So first one is like on off the second one is on off off third one is on off 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 and you just go up to seven and then you have them start at the same time and then you end when everybody loops back and everybody hits the one again does that make sense yeah but i can imagine like one person gets off and the whole thing crumbles like a house of cards right well if one person gets off they're just not going to finish because it takes like the more people you add you have to you have to like multiply you have to do some calculations to figure out how long it is firstly because if you do two people it's only a bar but then three people it's a bar times you it's like i forget what is that what is the the seven factorial do you know factorial the math system factorial the the idea of factorials (laughs) (laughs) so it's really interesting in order to figure out how long this piece the piece is going to be or how long this this the loop is you have to use factorials so I think it's like for every person you so for one bar it's one factorial for two it's like for one person it's one factorial for two people it's two factorial and then three so each person you add it becomes an extra factorial which is like almost like an order of magnitude it like it it it's exponential growth of okay of how long the piece gets so the more and then in the piece that i wrote i did um one to seven and then i did it digitally so i was like i don't care anymore and then i did like 20 to 20 uh, to 30 and that was a lot more sparse and it took I didn't even bother calculating because it would take like 10 years for it to like loop back into one again <laughs> um, <laughs> it's ridiculous so uh, but 18 Musicians doesn't completely do this but he does do it in this different ways where he'll have um, one looping repeating thing that's seven bars long and then the other person will have a looping repeating thing that's six and then someone else will have one that's like three and then someone else will have that's four and they all just play at the same time and they all just like go around and around and around and um reich gets away with this because he doesn't have to wait until everything sinks because that's impossible and it's not even doesn't even sound that exciting it's just kind of weird um the players will actually cue using uh i think it's the the clarinetist will like move her 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 clarinet up to indicate okay. that we're moving to the next section but i think the as I was reading something about about this piece specifically, the music for 18 Musicians is so tonal that it's even 
because it's in it's in I forget how many parts there are, but each part is a different chord, and the entire thing is just one longish chord progression. The entire piece yeah. is just one chord progression. It doesn't loop it. It just goes it just goes through the chord progression once and then ends. Yeah, I mean that's why it, I guess I was reminded of Common Tones and Simple Time by John Adams because I think that's the same deal there where he, the whole piece is twenty minutes long and he just goes from C to A major. Yeah, it's and similar. Similar. I love for sure. it. It's it's it is my favorite piece of music, which is an insane thing to say, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I think this the, operates on a very similar level where it's like. There's like this huge, long sort of epic scale where, where everything is sort of almost. Uh, what's the what's the analyzation where you can like reduce everything down? Um, oh, oh 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 oh! What is it? It's um, ah, Shankarian analysis. Yes. So I like, did it. <laughs> I remembered. It's almost like these guys are super into Shankarian analysis where they like They probably are. Pieces. Yeah, maybe they are. So it basically seems like, like Shankarian analysis is like um reducing when you're analyzing a piece of music. Normally if you'd analyze it you would be looking at all the different chords and how they interact and, and blah 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 and the instrumentation and stuff. Shankarian basically just goes, Okay, basically we're just looking at G to C, and that's the whole piece. If you just boil it down to like the the, the most basic thing that's going on, and yeah. so it's kind of it's kind of an interesting element of analysis, but it starts to feel like everything is nothing. Well, everything is the same. Yeah. Like you but just like, a piece. We, our, we did a little bit of that. Like when we were in school, we did a teeny bit of Shankarian analysis, and it was fun. I will admit. I mean, I can see the value in it. I just think that the reason that it's not good is that people use it as a value judgment. So it's like, if it passes the Shankarian analysis test, it means that it's good, which is not right. true because it's just, yeah, that's uh, silly. I mean, I don't see the value of using Shankarian analysis to analyze pop songs because that's not what it was built for. Like, I would no. imagine using Shankarian analysis to analyze Reich would make total sense. Because he came out of that, he probably knows, he, he's probably very well versed in Shankarian analysis and, you know, yeah. his music probably conforms to some of its rules and laws. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, yeah. So, it's just that it's, Shankarian analysis has a, has a bit, I think there's a video of Adam Neely explaining why it's sort of not good and is the cause of a lot of classical bigotry and elitism so god yeah know. we need we just need more of that don't we yeah you know Jeez. <laughs> anyway anyway so i really like reich because of this it's sort of this really long meditative rumbling like driving force that just like can catapults you to, to the just con i don't know it's beautiful i love it it's so great um let us go on to his guitar piece. So Steve Reich wrote a piece for, who is it? Tell me, Pat Metheny. So Steve Reich wrote a piece <laughs> for Pat Metheny. Are you asking called, your own brain to tell I you was, things? I was asking my own brain. <laughs> <laughs> and it's called okay. Electric Counterpoint. And it's so cool because in order to play it live, the person who plays it is required to record all eight parts, which include two bass parts, on eight different tape machines, or I guess nowadays you just record it on a laptop and play it off a laptop. But originally, because it was pretty old, he, they all did it on tape machines. And then at the beginning of the concert, you press play on, on all the tape machines, or I think maybe he just sums it. Oh, he probably just, it's just one track, but... And then you play along to the recorded backing track, you could say, um, as the eight ninth part, eight or I think it's oh no eleven parts. Sorry, there are eleven parts. And then you play like the lead part live. Does that make sense? Now, I'm a little surprised that you're saying that you like this because I know how much you hate loop pedals. So this is not a loop pedal because he wrote it out like you could you could perform it. Well, you could in theory perform this with real musicians on all eight parts. But the problem is that it's like the big piano phase. It would be so difficult because you would need almost I exact timing. Because you, I'll, okay, I'll let this play it and you'll see what I mean. There's a reason okay. why it has to be done this way. 
Okay. Okay. There are no effects on his guitar. That's not a delay. Those are the eight tape machines. Oh! Now, okay. Devil guitarist advocate. I feel like guitarists out there are just like, why don't you just use effects then? Because it won't sound the same. And because he has a lo- this is like a this is like a delay that you have hyper control over because you've literally played it and you're gonna just play the same thing. Over. Yeah. So like wow, he can control that's really interesting. The, like, mm, it is like you can control how many delays there are, how yeah. loud it will go, if it was gonna crescendo, if it's gonna do this, you know, blah blah blah. Um, it gets a bit more in depth later because it turns into the it sounds a bit more like music for eighteen musicians, but this sound is oh. Let's just hear it one more time. It's so beautiful. <laughs> so like, yeah. Can you see why it wouldn't be possible to play it with other people? Yes. It also seems like a huge amount of work to write a piece of music like this. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I think it, it probably was pretty difficult, but it wouldn't be that different from writing a normal piece. It would just... Because, I mean, it's almost an effect. Like, you you could probably program an effect to do something c- close to it. It wouldn't be, like... Yeah, I mean, I guess it's just, to but... me, it feels like the difference between meticulously making a home-cooked meal and um, ordering in takeout. Like, you had to do so many extra steps to get there, so you get something that is probably better, um, but just takes a lot more thought, you know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think also the the other thing is that this piece is quite old. Um, I think he wrote this in... I don't know when he wrote this, but he wrote it before that delay U2 because the, the the band the band U2 do you know them <laughs> they the the guitarist I don't like them at all but the guitarist from I the have Edge, not been living under a rock I don't yes know. I know the most boring band of all time okay, next so, to the red hot chili peppers woo there's two hot takes in one there woo woo anyway the guitarist from U2 <laughs> the Edge has the a signature edge. delay yeah I know he's called he has a fancy nickname. yes I know he has a fancy delay uh thing that and that sounds like this um yeah it's like sort of this anyway so before kind of, yeah i know Reich, i know what you mean i i used to listen to you two a lot actually because my dad really likes them <laughs> so actually that was part of dad rock for me legitimately growing up oh, okay yeah so so i'm you've, very you've, familiar it, with it re- that yeah did it remind you of this or no um when you said it now i'm like oh yeah totally but not when i was first listening to the to the reich piece mm. So, I try not to think about you two if I can help it. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, they've been influenced by this guy, hundred percent. So okay. All right. Um, I mean, I think it's good because because uh, Steve Reich is great, but uh, it's too bad, you know. It's just it's a little it's a little disappointing. But that's besides the point. <laughs> I love this piece. It's great. I think everyone should listen to the whole thing. It comes in three movements, but. The other movements are, are similar in, in, in feel and style, but I can't imagine playing this live, though. I don't understand. I've seen a, a, a... There's a jazz guitarist that did it recently, and I don't I don't understand. I, there must be ways to do it, but it, it just seems like... Because your timing has to be so on. Like, if yeah. you fall off, I don't know. Oof. Yeah. I don't think there's a click, either. I think you just kind of do it. I mean, I guess you just get used to it, but... Yeah. I guess it's, it's interesting. A lot of practice then. Uh, yeah. yeah, a lot of practice. So this this piece is also like a good example of the piano phase, but done well. Like I really like this. I'm not a huge fan of piano phase, but I think it proves the point of like, it's very clearly that. Can mm-hmm. you see the connection? Is there a connection? 
Um, yes, I think so. It's got that like effect vibe rather than uh, I played this a bunch of times vibe. <laughs> yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. It's such a it's such a minimalist um, uh, like uh, thing. Like it's the it, and I mean that like everything is so minute that like you don't notice it as like a thing that you can pick apart immediately it mm-hmm. just comes across as a wash of a particular sound so it comes across as an effect rather than a writing technique yeah a wave i always picture water when i listen to this like a giant wave mm. crashing or something for some reason mm. i don't know why it's really nice so this is the piece also that like made me led me to the to the to describe his music as sort of like organic algorithms i think i mentioned this before but i really think that's a very apt description of how he works because he's sort of he has a plan obviously and he has sort of set uh algorithms i don't want to say maybe algorithms but he has like patterns that are very that he doesn't deviate from too much um and then he sort of finesses them to be a bit more organic and sort of pleasing for lack of a better word um but i think that's that's why i like him and i don't like philip glass because philip glass he doesn't do the organic algorithm stuff. He doesn't he doesn't go as you said, he doesn't move. He doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> no, no, he he moves, but he doesn't go anywhere. But yeah, I think you can probably also notice that there's a lot of nature documentaries that use the Steve Reich sound. Um I would argue that maybe the commercial car commercial seems a bit more glassy and yes, Adamsy. Definitely. I'm not, I didn't hear yeah. too much in the, or maybe just in the examples you showed, but I think... No, I you're think right, because the car commercials that we were playing don't go anywhere. It's just... Right. There's no phasing, there's no extra elements being added on, it's just that, and then there's a voice that says, like, what if you could go anywhere with your life or whatever, right? Like, then not move. You're absolutely right. It's very much closer to Glass. Yeah. But that's why I wanted to start with those, because Philip Glass is one of the big fathers of this right like he is mm-hmm. one of the first people who started doing this kind of stuff yeah 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 i think that about wraps it up for steve reich yay uh, yeah and next time we're going to be talking about my favorite composer john adams who we've referenced many times um and so we'll be comparing him with what we just heard they have a lot of similarities um but John Adams was influenced by Reich, so he's another kind of. Oh, he's step. after Reich. Um, I I think th- n- not after after like they were alive at the same time, but he was definitely influenced by him and Glass, mm. for sure. But we'll get okay. into that next time. Cool. Well. Yeah. Uh, uh, should we sign off? This is a signing off period of time, I think. Yeah. I am a person who makes sound under the name Grain Wing. And Happy Kid Toy Band. I am on many different things. You can check the Instagram and probably the YouTube description for links. And what do you, where what do you do, Holly? Do you make things? Ugh, what don't I do now? Um, you can find my music um, by my name, Holly Beckmeyer. I'm on all the streaming platforms. You can find me. Oh my goodness! You can find me on TikTok now. Da-da-da. I did it. TikTok. I'm there. So you can look for me under Holly B Music, um, and I'm always there just making sounds and doing things. I don't know. I'm too old for this. All right? You're too old for this? Wow. Too old for TikTok. All right. Well, thanks for listening.